All right. Hey, everyone. It's been a while. Uh, I took a break from doing my own recordings because I happened to be invited onto another show. And that hasn't been released yet, so I'm not going to spoil it. But uh, today, we have parentheses I joining us to discuss utopian anarchism and the experience of living on communes and whatever else happens to come from that. Uh, parentheses I has been in the anarchist community for quite some time and has done multiple podcasts and made other appearances. Uh, they also have their own blog that you could find at parentheses i.blogspot.com. And uh, yeah, we're going to just roll right into it and um, have a discussion about these things. So parentheses I, uh, how are you doing today? Oh, yeah, pretty good. <laughs> this is my first time being a part of a, a YouTube podcast. Yeah. Have you ever done video before? Oh, well, not in, not in podcast format. Okay. But I do have a, a video also on YouTube of me talking uh, at the Mars Society convention. <laughs> so <laughs> I am on oh. YouTube in some sense. <laughs> okay, I'll have to put a link to that in the <laughs> description. So let's, uh, let's just do a little bit of background. I know that in the past, you focused a lot on nonviolent communications. And uh, sometime... I don't know, a few years ago, you came to the conclusion that that wasn't really what you wanted to be focused on at the moment and haven't really gone back to it. Um, do you want to, why don't you give a little background on what that is and what potential you thought it had and what wound up happening? Uh, let's see. Uh, my background with that. Well, I guess it came in a way indirectly from my background with anarchism. Uh, I've been an anarchist for about 25 years now, <laughs> but uh, I think 20 years ago actually was when I really discovered nonviolent communication. And that came about like from having a number, a series of negative experiences with the anarchist scene and uh, kind of disappointment and disillusionment. And uh, then with nonviolent communication it takes these principles that I'd call anarchist principles of like trying to, you know, find consent instead of trying to have domination relationships interpersonally and to try to find ways to, to find more mutual understanding and to come to more clear understandings and then ultimately agreements between people that are in conflict with each other. And right. So, and yeah. NVC is, it's not just a term you're using. It's actually a developed process, right? There's, there's okay. steps you could take to uncover what people's needs are, right? And uh, yeah. what are some of those steps? Yeah. So, yeah, nonviolent communication, also known as NVC, was created by this guy, Marshall Rosenberg, who passed away a couple of years ago. And uh, so it's like a whole kind of process that there might even be some kind of service mark, trademark around it, too, <laughs> you know, being owned by somebody. But like, uh, but with that being said, uh, one way to look at it is, well, the core thing I'd say with NVC is that all human beings have the same basic underlying fundamental needs. And these needs, of course, would be stuff that we're all familiar with, like food and water and shelter and rest and all that. But then also uh, more interpersonal needs, like a, a need for meaning, a need to contribute, to be understood, to have some sense of personal power or agency and things like that. And so uh, the premise is that everything that people say or do is motivated by some underlying fundamental human need that we all have. And so that once we identify those things, with each other, we can have more of a sense of interpersonal connection and understanding between each other. Right. And these are well-developed ideas, not just in NVC, but Abraham Maslow and a lot of social psychology deals in the same territory of uh, all the, uh, the stack of needs that universally sh are shared by all people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It does come out with that same tradition of humanistic psychology, but right. uh, I would say like a difference is that, uh, like Maslow viewed it more as like a hierarchy of needs, mm -hmm. whereas uh, NVC views it as like needs that at any given moment, it could be any particular need, whether it be, you know, material, which Maslow considers the basic one, or whether it be like more of the kind of ethereal needs, like uh, meaning and purpose in life and stuff like that. And yeah, that, so it's yeah. more situational. Yeah, yeah, moment by moment instead so of, yeah. What is an example of when you would use 
NBC? Give me like a scenario. Oh, well, I guess, uh, yeah, like, say like, yeah, somebody says something that pisses you off, <laughs> which happens, you know, all the time. Uh, and so like, uh, so like, well, first, like, in a situation like that, you could use it with yourself, you know, where you can recognize that you are pissed off. And then you can just take a moment, take a step back and you're like, okay, I'm really upset right now. You know, I have a, a need for respect. I want to be respected. I want to be understood and stuff. I want other people's to be acknowledged as well. Those because you could be thinking some thoughts like, oh, so and so totally doesn't give a shit about these people. And so you say, Oh, I want these people to be cared for. And so that's the self-empathy, they call it. And then you try to like do the empathy with the other person. It's like, why could they possibly have done what they did or said what they said? And then you could do some guesses, you know, are they wanting uh, to like express themselves? Are they trying to make a contribution in a way that I don't really understand initially, but they're trying. And you can just make these guesses and you can ask the person and you can have a, a dialogue based on the, the back and forth of trying to ask for what the needs are and trying to identify the needs for the other person as well as yourself. Oh, I can't hear you right now. <laughs> oh, do you aim for a resolution to whatever the situation is or is it more ambiguous and you just let things hang there once you've... Uh uncovered what the underlying needs are. Yeah, yeah, so you aim for resolution. Uh, and the, with uh, NBC, they aim for what they call the, the clear, tangible, doable request. Mm. Uh, ultimately, you ask somebody or ask yourself or ask both yourself and other people concrete, specific things that can be done to address the situation. So uh, like you wouldn't do like what a lot of people commonly do of like saying, I want you to be a better person. I want you to be more considerate because that's so amorphous. It's like, well, Everyone has different ideas of what that can look like. Right. Or, you know, you'd say specifically at this time and at this place, you do this specific thing. Yeah. And um, I, we're going to talk about this in a little bit uh, as far as how this fits into your experience living in intentional communities. But uh, before we get into that, how would you say that the anarchist milieu has received your um promotion of NVC generally or uh, depending on the type of anarchist and what were some of the things you bumped into? Yeah, well, <laughs> well, it's interesting. In a way, you're kind of speaking to like, well, I've had like in my years of being an anarchist, like different phases in which there's one thing I'd really work hard to promote and stuff. And, and then I kind of get away from it and stop doing it. So what you're referring to is that one phase I went through of really working hard to promote NVC in the anarchist scene. Yes. <laughs> I did that for a few years and then I stopped doing that. But uh, but during the time that I worked to promote it, like uh, yeah, I found like kind of like a a core like group of like friends of people that kind of converted to become NVC anarchists. <laughs> uh, I even like for a period of time even had a phrase uh, what I called compassionate anarchism and had a, a pamphlet and stuff that I handed out and all that kind of stuff. And so, but beyond that, you know, I have seen like uh, here and there in all kinds of places uh, online or in person some people that adopted NVC or uh, wrote NVC stuff, created NVC practice groups in anarchist circles, hmm. uh, as well as the opposite people that view NVC as being complete bullshit. And <laughs> being right. racist and so yeah, so I've had both kind of receptives. Well, one of the, one of the main uh, issues I think you'd run into is uh, the question of violence as yeah. is generally discussed in anarchist circles and perhaps the wider debate about pacifism uh, how would you relate NVC to a more pacifist view? Do you consider yourself a pacifist or is, are these two different things? Yeah. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, I'd say like for like philosophically, because there is like a whole component to NVC that goes right into philosophy stuff. So hmm. that might be right up your alley there. <laughs> yeah. But like, uh, yeah. And so one of the philosophical inspirations for NVC is the philosophy of uh, Mohandas Gandhi and his okay. like satyagraha and ahimsa and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, but, uh, and so in that sense, if you were to like really be strict about the, the Gandhi lineage, you could say that, you know, NVC is like an anarcho-pacifist anarcho thing or that would be the most uh, comfortable company it would be and would be the pacifists. But like, uh, no, I don't, well, I think for various points, I did consider myself an anarcho-pacifist, but I don't anymore. And uh, I would say, like, the key thing with NVC is, like, like, not wanting people to make agreements and stuff 
if they're feeling like coerced or that kind of demands and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, it's based on consent or even you can say pacifism. But at the same time with NVC, they do, there is like a belief that protective use of force, like if somebody or something is going to be cause like immediate physical danger that you got to do what you got to do to like have there be a safety to kind of restore the situation to be, be safe. And uh, so with that, you could use physical force or violence. But the key thing is like when you do that, you don't do it to punish somebody or to like enforce your demand, but more like to like have safety in the moment. Yeah. And that bleeds into different understandings of what justice is, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, NBC is, like, uh, is very much connected with like a restorative justice kind of scene. Like, right. Not punishing people, but like to create more understanding and more harmony and agreement between everybody, including those that suffered harm. Yeah. So, and I know that's a big topic. I don't know if we want to dive too deeply into it because it could take up the whole of the show. Oh, yeah. um, let's quickly, or not quickly, but let's discuss some of your background with intentional communities. Cause I feel like it's hard to talk about NVC outside of a context and uh, an interpersonal context even. Yeah. So um, I know you've lived in a number of intentional communities, but before we go into that, uh, just conceptually, what is the difference between an intentional community and a commune? And what are some of the stereotypes about them that are true and the ones that aren't? Yeah. So. And for me, yeah, I got like into intentional communities before NVC, but I kind of wish it was the other way around because my experience with intentional communities, I kind of said and did things that weren't as graceful and, and harmonious as I wish. But like, no, uh, so intentional community would be uh, when people live together intentionally. So that can be uh, like where you share any kind of living space and even like roommates in a roommate situation. I would say if you have a situation where you have clear agreements, like regular meetings, maybe even a name for the kind of place you live, that you could call that an intentional community. And you could even say it's like a spectrum too, like of less inform less formality and more formality, right? So okay. like, even like a living situation where you have roommates and stuff, you could say it's a very kind of amorphous, informal, intentional community. And then on the other hand, the really extreme thing, uh, such as Twin Oaks in Virginia, where I used to live at, that's like super formal. <laughs> there's, right. like, there's like bylaws and constitutions and membership contracts and all these membership process that you go through for all these different things uh, where decision making, resource allocation, everything has like lots of rules and guidelines. And, and a lot of people, including myself, ultimately, were just really turned off by that and didn't want that kind of environment. But you can have all kinds of stuff in between, including like co-housing or, you know, you have a piece of land and everybody has their own little place on that land. And you just see each other like once a week or something. So yeah, you can like have all kinds of arrangements, even student co-ops too, you could say is an intentional community. Yeah, that's true. Um, to focus more on the more formal ones like Twin Oaks, um, what, how, are, how are these things financed and what is the uh, expectation as far as labor contribution and things like that? Well, well, like ones that are like Twin Oaks, uh, their finance, they have collectively owned and managed businesses on site that they run and they make products that they sell on the capitalist market. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and actually when I lived at Twin Oaks, uh, they at the time had like a contract with Pier 1 Imports where they made all the hammocks <laughs> that Pier 1 sold across the country. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you could always walk into any like Pier 1 and see like a Twin Oaks hammock there. And so... <laughs> Yeah, what comes to mind then is that's a lot like the kibbutzim in Israel. Is oh, yeah. yeah, they're they're agricultural, or they were for the most part, but then they eventually uh, participated more and more in the market, basically through co cooperative businesses that they would uh, that they would run, even including like plastics manufacturing and things like that. Yeah. Um. So yeah, what is privacy like in these type of spaces? Well. Like, again, like saying like these type of spaces, like it all depends on the kind of place you're talking about. Like, like uh, Twin Oaks. Or... Yeah. So like Twin Oaks, uh, the way that one runs is uh, they have different residential buildings and every member has their own bedroom. And so you have like, you know, your neighbors and stuff 
that are also like members. And I think like for even there, they have like children that are not considered members, you know, at a certain age, they get their own bedroom as well. But then uh, I guess it's kind of like, even like with a, a housemate, roommate kind of situation, there's still stuff where you could like hear each other occasionally through the walls and <laughs> you oh, share yeah. the same bathroom and you share the same uh, kitchen and stuff too. So and yeah, if you're about... wanting like lots of privacy, you know, it's not really good for lots of privacy, but neither would like a roommate situation or even like an apartment where you can hear your neighbors. <laughs> right. And, and technically it's right. It's not like written in, in any kind of stone that privacy is, has to be that way. Like if they could afford it, everybody could probably have their own uh, separate living space. Right. Well, it's interesting. Then there's like the East wind commune uh, that is connected with twin Oaks, but they're located in Southern Missouri. And they've been around since the 70s. Uh, they make their money by selling the nut butters that you can find in like co-ops all across the country hmm. <laughs> for East Wind nut butters. And uh, they have a lot more land than Twin Oaks does uh, out in the Ozark Mountains. And they have like a, a policy there that if somebody, a member there wants to, they can build their own structure in the woods on their property and just live out there. So you could have then potentially lots of privacy if you have your own little shack in the woods far away from everyone else. And is that one that you lived on or...? Uh, I've I've visited there a few times, but I never lived there. Nice. Yeah. Um. So I know you said you started experimenting with uh, living in these uh, intentional communities before you discovered NVC. Um. What were some of the conflicts though that you ran into when you were when you were living on them? Yeah. Well, I guess. But well, like the one that kind of the big conflict that led to me leaving Twin Oaks community was, uh, well, basically like me and other people that were like younger anarchist people there at the time, like we wanted like lots of radical change at Twin Oaks to change the whole structure to have it be even more anarchist values reflected, like, you know, direct democracy and more of a kind of free kind of anarcho communist thing. And but, what were they what were they doing at the time for decision making? Oh, yeah. So the decision making they're doing then and still now, too, uh, is a kind of a representative democracy model where like the members like vote to elect three people they call planners hmm. and the planners ultimately make the decision. But there's also a mechanism that if the members disagree with what the, the three planners agree to, they could override it if they get enough votes. And okay. uh, there's also like the managers of the workplaces at Twin Oaks. Because they have workplaces at the businesses, as well as like stuff like child care and cooking communal meal, meals and cleaning and stuff, uh, shopping, you know, all those things that are not bringing an income for the community, you can still work in those areas. And this and that brings me to another thing at Twin Oaks, they have a labor credit system where oh. like you're supposed to work like basically 40 hours more or less a week. And then you fill out your labor sheet that, you know, has your schedule for work for the on that sheet as well as like how many hours you worked in each area and then they budget in the whole thing of like how many hours each area for you create labor credits and if you work more than 40 hours a week you can bank that for like a vacation not having to work as much in a future time and so basically it, it has a you know now that i've worked regular wage jobs you know hourly jobs i've uh noticed it's pretty similar you know and <laughs> people like wanting more hours less hours you know talking about hours in this kind of abstract way and so like what I problem that I had at the time was like the labor credit system. I wanted more of a free flowing anarcho communist thing where people like work or don't work, you know, based on their needs and desires instead of like the rules that you have to work a certain number of hours. And, and uh, yeah. <laughs> and so why, why wasn't that uh, ultimately accepted? Oh, well at Twin Oaks, it's, you know, about a hundred people that live there. So you have to get, you know, a sizable amount of agreement and, uh, being an angry young anarchist and talking about how we need to uproot everything and change everything, a lot of people were not into the idea of, you know, doing this radical change. It's this model that's existed for over 50 years now for, you know, for Twin Oaks, it's been there. All so right. So it's a bit of like traditionalism versus, uh, yeah, someone who might, who might not be around that long proposing oh. all this radical stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. The, you could say there's an institutional inertia for Twin yeah. Oaks. Yeah, yeah. And then here I was like a relatively new guy, young person that came in and wanted to change everything right away. And so what it ultimately resulted in is like the anarchists were like younger people like me that didn't end up staying that long. And the people that were fighting back against what I was saying were the more older people, old enough to be my parents, 
you know, been there for a bunch of years and we're probably going to stay there for a lot longer than me. <laughs> and yeah. And, and what time period was this in? This is oh not recently. No, no, we're talking, uh, yeah, 1999 was when right. I joined them. <laughs> so, so. I, and I actually joined there because I thought Y2K was going to happen and that oh. the world was going to collapse. And I wanted to be safely like in, in an intentional community when it happened. So but, was this before or after uh, the Battle of Seattle? Oh, so I joined, uh, actually, I joined like a, a month or two before the Battle of Seattle. See, and, oh, interesting. <laughs> Yeah, which is kind of crazy. Like, if I had known that the Seattle was going to be such a big thing, my life could have taken a different direction. Yeah. So, for people who might not know this, the Battle of Seattle was one of the big turning points in United States anarchism because you had a, a building uh, movement that was questioning the current globalization strategies of the United States and their foreign policies and the way those impacted. Um, uh, other nations through IMF loans and things of that nature. And uh, eventually it turned into a, what was it, two or three days of um, pretty much street occupation in Seattle that had pitched battles with the police and ultimately... Yeah, and they disrupted the World Trade Organization too. Yeah, a, a successfully uh, shut it down, really. Yeah. And this is something that uh, David Graeber goes into all the time and a lot of ideas about direct action and uh, affinity groups and what used to be called the spokes model oh, come yeah. out of that. Yeah. And um, it's really, that's the scene that I came into. So you were even before that getting into anarchism, which. Oh, so I got into anarchism in uh, 1996. I remember because like the, the presidential election of uh, Bob Dole versus Bill Clinton. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> yeah. And, and it, it was a pretty obscure uh, tendency at that time. I mean, it yeah. was... And, and actually, when I joined, uh, I discovered anarchism by dropping out of high school and just, like, hanging out at the public library. <laughs> and then, like, uh, like, from the books there and the primitive internet at the library at the time, uh, I just came across libertarian socialism. And just, like, the phrase libertarian socialism, it was like a light turning on. Like, oh, my God. This explains exactly what I believe in, <laughs> because, you know, before that, I was thinking I like libertarianism, but I don't like all the capitalist bullshit. And I like socialism, but I don't like all the control freak tendencies. <laughs> and so like, the idea that you can, like, combine the two things, I'm like, oh, my God, it just blew my mind. <laughs> yeah. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about your ideas about utopian anarchism. And then uh, maybe we'll come back to talking how that uh, relates to the commune stuff a little more just to lay the the groundwork of sort of where your headspace is and the way you approach uh your anarchist practice okay uh so you want me to explain utopian anarchism yeah, yeah let's start so you said um before we were uh recording about how uh it's similar to utopian socialism and yeah. uh let's just assume people don't even know what that is because it's had such a bad um you know, uh, it's been dragged through the dirt by Karl Marx and Engels and everyone yeah, since then. So, yeah, uh, I think Marx actually even used the word, the phrase uh, "utopian socialism" as a kind of swear word. You know, for the socialists that don't agree with him. Uh, yeah. And so, yeah, utopian anarchism. Well, that's a term that I've taken to calling myself recently. You know, I've used all kinds of different words to describe my kind of anarchism. So. Currently, it's utopian anarchism. Maybe next time I talk with you, it'll be something else. But like, okay. <laughs> yeah. But Fair like, enough. So yeah, the idea is that, uh, well, utopian socialism is, uh, actually, I wrote down a definition here that I found, because like there is a Wikipedia entry on the whole topic, but uh, it describes it there actually as a, a presentation of visions and outlines for imaginary or futuristic ideal societies with positive ideals being the main reason for moving society in such a direction. And another thing I think that kind of incorporates that as well is, uh, let's see if I can find. Okay, it's Buckminster Fuller, uh, not an anarchist, but like somebody that I really enjoy his thoughts and things. Yeah. A, you never change things by fighting against the existing reality. To change something, you build a new model that makes the old model obsolete. And this is very much against sort of the Marxist uh, orthodoxy or like the dialectic 
idea that you have to negate the negation in order to have your off haven or whatever and yeah. uh, create something that subsumes it, right? So this is a really like a uh, an orientation where you let your imagination do the work and um and uh find the resources you can to make it real right yeah or another way you can look at it is like what is your goal and being focused you know goal oriented <laughs> and then you can uh, try to analyze like what's going on to make that goal work and then you can work your way backwards to like uh going back to from your goal you can like how did you get there like uh how what what capacity what resources you know what skills and understandings do you need to have to get to that point and i'm actually uh pretty much of the same mind on this so i'm gonna hold off on saying my opinion and i want to know yours first yeah. uh why do you think so many people reject that approach if you think they do oh no a lot of people really <laughs> uh in fact <laughs> like well, I, I don't know if you want me to go into a story. <laughs> I was going to yeah, yeah, a please. Tangent there. Yeah. Okay. So, do you remember NEFAC, the Northeast? Yes. Korea? Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, for a small period of time, I was like an associate member of NEFAC, uh, and then I went to one of their conferences, and I had a and just to... just explain what NEFAC oh, is NEFAC real is. quick. Yeah. But... This is like uh, yeah, old person thing. <laughs> it's been uh, it was big. It started actually from around the time as the Battle of Seattle of. Uh, and right after that, it inspired people in the Northeast. So it's the Northeastern Federation of Anarchist Communists. Mm -hmm. uh, and these were people that they really loved the platform and platformism, you know, and yeah. that's goes back to the organizational platform of libertarian communists from way back when. And, uh, and so they wanted to use the platform as their, their Bible to kind of create like a new anarchist federation to replace the love and rage anarchist federation, uh, which had been like the previous big anarchist federation in the US. And uh, NEFAC was also like, it was both based in Canada, uh, Montreal in particular, and the, the Northeast. So it was like an international thing. And uh, yeah, like they were actually more into the idea of like organizing like uh, labor unions and tenants unions and stuff like that. That was their big focus. And they created like a journal that they published and they were at a lot of big protests. So I went to like one of their conferences in Boston and uh, I had a whole proposal there where I wanted to have NEFAC endorsement to create or kind of uh, shepherd or steward like a new federation of anarchist intentional communities. Because, mm -hmm. you know, my whole belief then was like, if we create more anarchist intentional communities or communes where people are sharing their income and resources together and living and organizing in an anarchistic way, that that's the way to do it. So even like way back then, I still kind of had these same beliefs I do now of like wanting to like promote new alternatives for people that are actually living their lives in these ways. And so yeah, I've, this has been like a through line throughout my anarchist career, so to speak. Yep. <laughs> and so like, so I proposed that uh, in a whole uh, proposal. I wish I still had the documents that I wrote at the time. I've totally lost it. But so I made the the, the whole presentation. And then the first person to, to speak was somebody that you might know, uh, Wayne Price. <laughs> I was just going to mention him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He, uh, so he was the first person to stand up and he, he said, I totally strongly strongly oppose this <laughs> and then he just shot it down and i was just like crushed because like i i was under the impression that like anarchists everywhere would love this idea of creating more anarchist communes that you can live and work at but like wayne price was like pissed he was like he viewed it as a betrayal to the whole ideal of like working class organizing and for right. him working class organizing meant unions and, and protests and all they, that kind of they see it as something like drop out, dropping out right that's sort yeah, of yeah yeah yeah. And for me, I kind of view dropping out as more or less impossible because we're so like integrated in with the system mm -hmm. that you can't completely ever drop out. It's more like how you want to choose to relate to it, the system, you know, but uh, yeah, so they, but they, yeah, like you said, they view it as dropping out. They view it as like turning your back on society and all that. And, and just like hippie bullshit, basically. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, the, so Wayne Price, but also I don't was, um, uh, Bookchin, someone who's involved in NEFAC, or was he someone who was just uh, sort of in that area and had similar problems with lifestyle anarchism? 
Oh yeah, yeah, you're right. Because he he was alive in Vermont at the time, so he he lived in the Northeast. But no, there was a schism at the time between like the NEFAC people and the social ecologists. Ah, but, yeah, <laughs> yeah. The social ecologists uh, were more into like libertarian municipalism, where like uh, neighborhood assemblies would be what they would focus on and where people live and stuff. And so that it can include people's where they work, but that's not, they weren't as focused on the economic aspect. Whereas NEFAC is more focused on like the working class and they're, class based kind of thing. They're, yeah, they're labor oriented. And yeah, yeah. For the most oh, oh my God, you were just reminded me of another thing. I, <laughs> I never met Murray Bookchin, but I did piss him off. I was, <laughs> so I guess, yeah, I pissed off Wayne Price and Murray Bookchin. But <laughs> with Murray Bookchin, so he wrote that, uh, small little book, Social Anarchism versus Lifestyle Anarchism yep. and Reachable Chasm. And that was a big controversial thing in the anarchist Still scene. is. Oh, it still is. Oh, wow. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So like, uh, so, you know, I, I read that book and then I read Bob Black's retort, you know, rebuttal. And, but I was always into this uh, intentional communities and income sharing communes kind of thing. So me and a friend of mine at the time, we created this organization called the Anarchist Communitarian Network, the ACN. And we had a, it doesn't exist anymore. It's been different. Yeah, it sounds familiar though. Yeah. Oh yeah, because uh, we had a website, you know, we had some publications and and I checked actually the big anarchist library archive in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, the Lobbity Collection has mm -hmm. an issue of a publication we made. So, so that kind of makes us immortalized now in the anarchist. Yeah. <laughs> but like, uh, so for that organization, the Anarchist Communitarian Network, we created a slogan called social anarchism is our lifestyle. And so that's, that's based on his, uh, his, you know, anarchist, uh, social anarchism versus lifestyle anarchism thing. Right. But like with that phrase that kind of says, no, actually you integrate the two, you have your lifestyle be social anarchism. And what's so fun, what's funny about that too, is that now when anarchists call themselves social anarchists, uh, they're mostly referring to something like NEFAC. Yeah. Uh, which would be a labor orientation and not so much referring to something like municipal uh, libertarian municipalism. Yeah. And it's just the way that this has shifted over time, I think um, sort of like hinges on what the individualist anarchists are, uh, are into. Well, because... then also oddly enough over time now, when people think of uh, Maury Bookchin's work, they think of Rojava. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yes. Which is, yeah, so that is, uh, yeah, the way that social anarchism has been re reinterpreted since uh, Bookchin wrote that is pretty interesting because, yeah. yeah, a lot of people back then might have called what social anarchists do now lifestyleism. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, that, so that's basically the critique you think uh, uh, they have of your approach then, right, is um, they basically are, I think it's lifestyleist. Oh, yeah, yeah, lifestyle, basically, and uh, yeah, and not having, I guess, both the kind of intellectual rigor that they would want, <laughs> as well as, uh, I guess they would be concerned that we wouldn't be, like, reaching out beyond our little sectarian, ideological little bubbles and subculture, you know? Right. Uh, which kind of, you know, actually, I would say that, you know, the whole thing about being trapped in subculture uh, I would say it's a valid critique, but I'd say it also equally applies to them as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And really, they're uh, they're mixing up a a marketing issue or like a a, a PR issue with a uh, practical issue of like, mm -hmm. you know, if you have the PR, people are going to find out about it. Yeah. Yeah. One way or the other. I mean, whether that's a uh, the IWW or it's uh, an intentional community, if you are orientating yourself towards some sort of mass communication, then it's not really a matter of being sectarian. It's just, you know, have you done that? Yeah. And and then also, like, I've discovered both, like, with my little scenes that I created, because, uh, you know, I had my little time of, like, with the Anarchist Community Network and my, my time with the Compassionate Anarchism NBC stuff. And, and both times I kind of succeeded in creating tiny little scenes based around that ideology or beliefs or whatever. And then both times I'd say in my situation with that, as well as like larger, like examples of uh, schools of thought, like within any kind of anarchist philosophy or tendency you talk about, is that you find people in these scenes that some that are more knowledgeable and more with the, the philosophy and the ideology and others that are more like 
friends of those people or that have a limited understanding or kind of they kind of glom onto it or tag along. But it gives the impression that like whatever little anarchist scene or pocket you're talking about has actually more committed, knowledgeable, dedicated members than our actual, you know, true. <laughs> yeah. So there's like, yeah, there's a literacy that is uh, more or less widely distributed, right? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, varying levels of understanding and dedication to whatever your cause or ideal may be. So, um, so given all that, what so what wound up happening with NVC, and oh. how wh where did you find that it uh, failed your mission? Well, no, so I wouldn't phrase it that way. And you also, <laughs> I think you're referring to like a blog that I wrote that I I want to write a new blog. And I want to write more in general. I just haven't been in that headspace for a while. I want to write about how I'm not really anti or not or detached from NVC. Like I, I've kind of gotten more into it since I wrote that blog. <laughs> but I, I did have like this great kind of disappointment and heartbreak that I'll share with you. <laughs> so basically sure. what happened is uh, the founder of uh, NVC, uh, Marshall Rosenberg, you know, he passed away in about, I think, 2014, I think it was. Uh, and so when he died of course the whole subculture and uh, the organization that i think owns the copyright center for nonviolent communication they they had to kind of they went through like a, a process of what do we do now that the founder and creator guy is dead like what's our direction because in a way you could say like that organization was based on it existed really to like organize and facilitate his trainings for that one guy and so mm -hmm. now it's like okay we're not all as focused on one guy and the nbc people they do have a, at least in theory, a belief that like uh, things should be organized more horizontally without domination, you know, and you have more of a network model instead of a top down model. And so if you don't have a big charismatic leader, then it makes it easier to have a more of a networking model instead of being focused on the top dog. <laughs> and so yeah. they, they instituted this process to like restructure the whole organization for the Center for Nonviolent Communication. Uh, and they wanted it to be based on more of a decentralized network model. And a lot of people worked on it and they even paid somebody uh, that was a friend of mine that to be a secretary, to put you know time and effort into like creating the new organization structure. And they created like a book length document to, uh, outlining this new uh, ideal decentralized network organization and how it would work and all that. And uh, you know, I was involved with it. A lot of friends of mine were involved. And then at the last moment, the official board of directors for that organization just said, no, we're not into this anymore. And they even, for my friend that was paid to like do the secretarial work, they didn't even tell her that they're not into it. They just cut off the paying her. And, and, and then, and then it's just like all that time and effort was like for nothing and with no communication, which, you know, nonviolent communication, you know, you'd think that communication would be an important part. <laughs> so, so like, I was just so heartbroken and upset. I was just like, fuck this. Fuck NVC, fuck these people. <laughs> and so I then like had a few years in which I had nothing to do with NVC. And you know, that was when I wrote the blog saying I'm, why I'm not into NVC anymore. Yeah, I think you also talked about it on uh, one of Aragorn's shows too. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, I remember that. There was that, yeah, the nonviolent communication episode. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, okay. So it was more like uh, not a theoretical break, but a uh, practical break. Wow. And then also, like, I have come across, like, even, okay, nonviolent communication, the, the main selling point that they present it with is that it helps with conflicts and stuff. And I, I've came across so many times within that little subculture or scene of NVC of people having really nasty conflicts and, like, relationships and organizations dissolving because they haven't found a way to resolve the conflicts. And so for me, that, that told me that, oh, the whole selling point of it being a conflict resolution tool is bullshit. Well, do so, you think there might be something of a selection bias that people who are trying to figure out how to deal with how conflictual they are to begin with are getting into NVC <laughs> to work that out and not being successful? Like yeah. maybe it would, maybe it would, it would work for someone who's less conflictual uh, to begin with. Yeah, and then you can also say, like sometimes NVC people say, like, oh, the conflicts remain unresolved because the people aren't really practicing NVC. <laughs> so then, you know, that, that's, yeah, a question as well. Like how much are people actually doing the practice as opposed to promoting it, but not doing it? Yeah. Right. And I feel like uh, that's kind of like a realization I had too. Like I still love the practice of NVC, especially like the empathic listening. That's a really important part too. Like taking your 
really giving a lot of time and space to really deeply understand people and listen to them uh, and have empathy to try to really understand what things are going on for, for the other person. And, and I love that because like that is such a rare thing to come across in our society where people like really take ample time and space to really understand each other and really deeply listen to each other. And I think like that would be, that's in a key part to my whole idea of a, an anarchist society too. Like having empathy and empathic understanding for everybody that seems like so crucial for relationships being sustainable. Well, and this is, so I think this is something that uh, I think would get overlooked by uh, people opposed to what you're calling utopian anarchism is that uh, you are taking something of like a grand idea, but you do wind up coming down to the nuts and bolts of even the interpersonal relationships and, and how those would um, impact the overall uh, achievement of the goals of that project, right? And that does wind up being a very uh, complicated and nuanced uh, anarchist approach. It's just that if you look at one piece of it at, at a time, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't um, parallel Marxism with uh, the way that uh, it's um, relating to the world, right? It's, it's um, really based on realizing goals and not based on responding to material conditions. Uh, well, yes and no. Like, I, I would say, like, for utopian anarchism, uh, I've come to realize that there's four distinct areas that one needs to pay attention to. And that sure. they all kind of, they're separate, but they all kind of affect each other. Okay, so the first uh, would be what you're just talking about, the uh, interpersonal relationships. And NVC, of course, is one thing that can help with that. Uh, restorative justice that we mentioned earlier is another thing that can help with it. Uh, but then I'd say uh, the second would be the stru social structures. So like, how do you structure your organization? How do you have a membership process, conflict resolution process, resource allocation systems? So the whole social structures or institutions. Uh, another component would be then going more like the internal, like uh, basically how is each individual doing? <laughs> uh, how much are, do they understand themselves? How much self-control do they have? How, how do they relate to their emotions and when they're you know, stimulated and upset or, and all that kind of stuff? Like, so for that meditation, you know, that is something I find very helpful. And uh, I did a few years that I was deeply involved with Vipassana meditation. Okay. Form and, wh and what is that? Because I know there's different kinds of meditation and they're, they're not all like. Yeah. So yeah, there's many different kinds Vipassana, it kind of comes out of a, a Theravada Buddhist tradition, but what they, this one guy, SN Goenka, who passed away a few years ago also, he created this whole model of having these 10 day residential retreats that are all free of charge for the students. And they they have these all around the world, uh, as well as different places in the U.S. Uh, sometimes they have centers that they run, you know, all the time, except during COVID. <laughs> but yeah. then they also have like places that they rent and stuff. And so it's basically during most of that time you do uh, silent meditation, but they have like uh, audio and video recordings of instructions for how to do the meditation. Okay. And and they have you know volunteers. It's all based on donation labor, no, uh, donation money, and volunteer labor, and the volunteers help like run it, you know, make the food and all the, you know, deal with whatever problems. But mainly it's supposed to be uh, during these, in these retreats, being aware of your breathing, you know, your respiration, your breath in, your breath out. And then after you, that's your starting point. Then they, after four days of just being aware of your breathing, uh, just noticing your body sensations, like all your sensations from the top of your head to the tip of your toes, everywhere, pleasant or unpleasant, like strong or subtle, just like being aware of the sensations and not judging it or analyzing it and trying to push it away. You just, you notice it and you move on. And so it cultivates like a self-awareness practice because for one, you're aware of your physical body. That's part of the point, but indirectly you become aware of your own mind because, you know, when you find, when you're doing the 10 days of that silent meditation, your mind's going crazy and you're thinking about all kinds of stuff. You're thinking about you know, things about you, what's in with your thoughts and feelings and body. You're thinking about everybody that's around you. <laughs> you're thinking about all the stuff you did in the past. You're thinking about all your plans or worries <laughs> for the future, <laughs> you know, and you're just, your mind's, so you get to become more aware of how your mind works too, as well as like, you know, your body and respiration. And so that kind of practice, I think is wonderful for cultivating self-awareness, self-understanding and self-control too, because mm -hmm. like 
you know, you're trying to meditate for like all these days, uh, you're going to learn like, you know, where your strengths and weaknesses are for your own self-control, controlling your own thoughts and, you know, just what you're living in the world, right? So sure. I'd say like this component, like for Pasana meditation, there's other practices too for self-help, self-improvement. That's an important part for utopian anarchism of like, I think looking inside every individual looking inside themselves and, you know, a self-analysis, right? Because I think, and this all goes into like mental health territory too, because I've noticed a lot of times in both anarchist circles and nonviolent communication circles, people that have varying degrees of neurosis or even psychosis sure. joining these like scenes and like, just because of their unexamined, you know, issues that they have personally, it creates havoc and disruption for everybody else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so I think if, if you had like an anarchist philosophy in practice that says, you know, every individual acknowledging and dealing with their own shit isn't vital for this anarchist society to, you know, function, you know, that's a really core component. Yeah, and I, I agree. Yeah, I think we both share like a deep interest in psychology and interpersonal uh, social psychology kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. I know we've talked a lot about Carl Rogers in the past and things like that. Yeah, and Carl Rogers, by the way, was a, a teacher or a professor for Marshall Rosenberg. Ah. The guy who created nonviolent communication. Okay, that, yes. yeah, that makes sense. So, um, that, so what was the fourth thing you said? Yeah. Uh, oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> you caught that, yeah. Because uh, then there's a the fourth component. And so that, way, I would say, is like the physical structures and systems. Like, uh, so that would go like how, like, what, how your building is done, made, you know, architecture, uh, your city planning and design, your, your food systems and your water systems and, you know, the soil that you grow your food. Like all these different, like, physical components, non-human stuff, but that we depend upon for survival like being aware of that and working with it in ways that, you know, ultimately help people. And so this, I'd say that area, like the work of Buckminster Fuller is like, he, he focuses a lot on that. And I would love to see more anarchists like focus on uh, Buckminster Fuller's work. Yeah. He, so, approach, so what about him? Because I, I'm about all I know about him is like Bucky balls. <laughs> so. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's weird. Yeah. A lot of times people uh, think of him as like the geodesic dome guy. Oh, yeah. that's right. Yeah. So yeah. Is that the, so that's the architecture component you're talking about? Uh, no, that, yeah, one of the things like, uh, let's see, I think I actually have another quote from him here as well. Okay, here you go. Another one that kind of encapsulates his approach. It's now highly feasible to take care of everybody on earth at a higher standard of living than ever known. Uh, it's selfishness is unnecessary and henceforth unrationalizable. And it's not, and the, uh, Okay, it's a matter of converting the high technology from weaponry to livingry. So basically, Buckminster Fuller, right? So he was acknowledging, like, he was alive, died in 19, early 80s, right? So he saw a lot of uh, World War I, especially World War II, especially the Cold War. Yes. And so he, he said, like, so much of uh, engineering and just resources of countries and the world in general is going to weapons and people just killing and maiming each other all over the world. And he said, well, if you took all that effort and time and money and you... you away from weaponry and to what he called like livingry, like the, the systems and technology you need for living a good life. If you put all that effort to making like life better for everybody, that it's possible that we can create like a higher standard of living and meet everybody's needs. And that basically so much like resources around the world is just squandered by weapons and war, but then other things as well, you know? Oh that, yeah. And, yeah. And the architecture thing is interesting. One of my, um, there's a couple of people I'm interested in that. One is Christopher Alexander. Who, I don't know if you've heard of him. He's oh, uh, yeah. notoriety is for something called a pattern language, which is um, basically supposed to be like a language of forms that someone learns uh, in order to communicate about and create architectural structures that are, uh, from his opinion, good. Um, and uh, I'm forgetting the other guy's name right now, who is really interesting and even wrote a little bit about anarchism. You know what? Let me, I have to look this up. So one second. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, Richard Sennett is the other guy and he's still uh they're both still alive 
and they um Richard Sennett is an urbanist and he goes and he uh he is actually involved in going into like uh poor areas and figuring out some sort of social architectural points and he writes a lot about craftsmanship and authority and really uh at the intersection of psychology and architecture and he's um he was a student of eric erickson and uh, the guy who uh who came up with um the uh the stages of conflict where uh you know where when you say someone's stuck in their adolescent phase and things like that you're they're referring to erickson's identity crisis oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah so he's the guy that has the different uh anyway um i think all this stuff is incredibly useful for an anarchist uh thinking and you just don't see a lot of it oh no no and so kind of what i would like to see happen is like more focusing on i guess like you would say these four realms is interconnected and should really focus on each one is vital for an anarchist society to be sustainable and successful right uh so the yeah individual psychological the interpersonal relationship wise the institutional structural realm and then like the physical realm uh and the, the physical systems and structures that meet people's needs and i was going to say just as a nice little kind of summary to encapsulate buckminster fuller's thought uh, I've heard it described as comprehensive, anticipatory design science. <laughs> so those, okay. those four words, it puts it together nicely that you, you compliment comprehensive for the whole system, for the whole world. Uh, right. Spaceship Earth was one phrase that he liked to use for the Earth to describe it. Uh, and then anticipating, anticipatory, right? Like all the different issues and problems that can come up, you know, being ready for it. Uh, and then design science, like you intentionally engineer and construct the kind of systems in the kind of world i'd say ultimately that you want and then the science part you know just like Karl marx you know he likes science <laughs> yeah. yeah so uh yeah that's all i think that's all really good what about some of the hurdles to practicing this stuff uh in the real world how familiar are you with that it sounds like you like have some decent experience with you know what it takes to find and buy land and what it takes to actually uh create some of these communal spaces and uh mm -hmm. let's talk let's talk a little bit about that and just how widespread the intentional community movement is in the united states and the co-op movement which uh both of these things get overlooked and people talk about moan dragon or they talk about you know different uh uh things in like the uh what was it the airport occupation and the uh I think it was France that turned into some sort of autonomous zone for a while. The ZAD. You hear about that? Oh, that was a year years ago because Yeah. Th there, was, there was also the one that happened like a couple years ago in Seattle, was it? Like the Chaz and the Chaz. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's a yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, but p what often gets overlooked is there's a deep history of uh intentional communities in the United States and cooperatives, especially rural cooperatives and uh yeah just go off a little bit about that and like what it takes to maybe even get started if you wanted to go that route well let's see i would say i'm not the expert in that area but i would advise you to like check out the website uh, ic.org that's for the foundation for intentional community and they have all kinds of resources like written uh, database of intentional communities uh, articles about how to create intentional communities and so yeah, a lot of stuff is written is is there. Uh, I don't. I wouldn't say that I've been like, because like there were a few times, including actually when I lived in Phoenix, Arizona, <laughs> where I tried to create like an intentional community kind of thing and it just failed. So I have a long history of failures in this area. So I'm probably not the best. <laughs> well, that's actually. I think that is what's important. Is like what were the what failed about them, and other people can learn from that. Yeah. Well, I think but like a, a, a clear thing is to like have an understanding of like what you were wanting to do together, like because like what's your your purpose, your mission, and then like going into the detail, like how are you can address all the different questions, you know, money, <laughs> resources, uh, conflicts, all these things, right? Like for example, the first time I tried to start an intentional community was uh, 
related to what I told you earlier here of like when me and a bunch of anarchists had the big conflict at Twin Oaks. So what that resulted in is like me and a bunch of the anarchists all leaving Twin Oaks at once, like close to like 10 me members or so. We all left Twin Oaks at the same time. And a few members is another commune connected to Twin Oaks called Acorn. You know, basically you have the Oaks. Oh, yeah. Right? <laughs> so uh, we had a, a couple members of Acorn too. That left Not the Twin same Acorn that uh, was involved in uh, political uh, no. stuff, right? Not No, this is the Acorn right. International Community. And yeah. I don't know if they still do, but at least at one point they did write on their website that they're an anarchist intentional community, but they might have changed that. <laughs> but like, okay, at the time around 2002, like a bunch of us left Twin Oaks and Acorn to go create a new anarchist intentional community in the rural Tennessee. And we found some land that was actually owned by an anarchist friend of mine from Boston, hmm. where like he and his friends had previously tried to create an intentional community there, but they failed. And then they left, but they still owned the land. So then we just paid rent to him to all move on to that land and create our own. And then that failed too. <laughs> oh. Because like what it turned out for at the time was for us is like we were just all angry, bitter, cynical people where like all we wanted to do is just kind of like hang out and talk shit about Twin Oaks and Acorn. And we weren't doing anything practical to like think about, okay, now we're our new place that we want to be different from Twin Oaks. How is it going to be different? What are we going to do? And we never came to any clear thought. It was more of this kind of hang out and party kind of thing is what it turned out to. Wow. Uh, okay. And I think, you know, hang out party kind of situations, this can easily happen with a lot of like young radicals. If there's no clear sense of purpose of what you're doing, the, the kind of the gathering or event or whatever can easily just be like a hangout spot until, you know, traveler kids come in, <laughs> drink a bunch, leave, you know, and you just, you do your thing for a while and then it just kind of fizzles out. And, and I've seen that happen a bunch and we kind of created a, a space like that in rural Tennessee as well. <laughs> yeah. 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 So uh, what about some of the other failures? Oh, well, let's see, I guess, uh, well, yeah. So when I lived in Phoenix, you know, uh, first time I met you in person, yeah. Like me and some friends, uh, we rented an apartment there and we wanted to create like a kind of a small it, so that this would be like the, in the more informal area with like like we wouldn't have a name for ourselves but we wanted to create intentional relationships of income sharing like polyamorous living together working together little place in an apartment unit <laughs> uh in the what is it i forget well so th th we we had like at minimum three at most like six people all living in these apartment units and with that i think it was the same kind of thing where we didn't have any kind of clear agreements and expectations and so it kind of well, resulted uh i guess the killing blow so to speak well for me at least you know it continued on without me for a few more months but for me it's like uh issues around polyamory <laughs> and not talking about yeah your emotional stuff that comes up you know, with polyamorous situations. And so, yeah, we weren't able to handle that. And then I ended up leaving and stuff and moved to Oregon at that time. But I think it's in a way, like the nonviolent communication concept of creating right. like clear, tangible, doable agreements. You know, you can, you can specifically, you can have like a timeline, you know, by, by X amount of time you do Y thing and having these kind of expectations and like you also deal with the emotional stuff underlying your agreements. I think that is so crucial and that we never did at all. <laughs> and I think what a lot of people would assume the type of stuff that would go wrong isn't that. I think what people think is like, oh, you'd have someone who doesn't want to work and uh, uh, that doesn't contribute. Or you have like you know, basically the free rider problem. Or, you know, you run into like financial disasters that ruin it. And it sounds more like actually what comes up first is these interpersonal dynamics that drive people away uh from the situation yeah yeah and then even with the whole thing like so and so doesn't want to work well you can say well as anarchists we don't want anyone to work so <laughs> right or as bob black put the the best thing about anarchism is it doesn't work so <laughs> <laughs> but then you can unpack it it's like okay well we still have these needs you know physical needs and interpersonal and emotional needs so like with all these things like how can we like meet these needs and how can we do it in a way that nobody feels coerced into meeting needs. And to kind of like unpack things and go into like really the specifics of what's going on, like as far as the practical level and like the emotional subjective level, just naming everything and stuff. Yeah, that's, so that's are you, what I would advocate, but 
I haven't had as much experience actually practicing. But you know what, I actually, I would want to say another thing too that you might not even be aware of, like another intentional community that I lived at, the last one I lived at, uh, it's a different model because there's different models for intentional communities. And so Twin Oaks is the egalitarian income sharing model. Mm -hmm. It's connected with the Federation for Egalitarian Communities, the FEC <laughs> organization. And they have a website too, thefec.org. It goes into all that stuff for the model. But uh, another model that I, I spent about two and a half years in also was uh, the Camp Hill model. And so Camp Hill, uh, they also have a website too, camphill.org. <laughs> and so what they are, they're based on the work of the philosopher Rudolf Steiner. Uh, oh, yeah. They're applying it to uh, supporting and working with people that have developmental disabilities. So in these communities, uh, you live and work with these uh, people that have developmental disabilities and you're like a caregiver. And uh, similar to Twin Oaks, everybody has their own bedroom and uh, including the, the clients as well as the staff. And, and in this case, your clients could have a bedroom directly next door to your bedroom. <laughs> So if somebody has some issue where they're like up at night screaming to themselves, you know, you hear it. <laughs> wow. But like, so the whole idea is like based on Rudolf Steiner's work, uh, which has like a spiritual component as well as a psychological and social component. The intention with that is to practice what they call social therapy. And so the idea is like you create like a, a lifestyle or a social environment where like how actually a lot of the things I'm talking about with utopian anarchism connects with that where like you have the personal component where like each person that participates in that, you know, not the, the clients, but the people that join voluntarily like, like us, right? you have the spiritual component, you do your meditation, your, your inner work, uh, you create like relationships that are harmonious and helpful, you know, and learning and all that kind of stuff. And you create the social structures. Uh, they, they do actually in Camp Hill, at least the founders originally intended for income sharing, you know, so it is like a commune in that regard. And the, and then also the physical environment, like they say, camp Hill community should be like nourishing, pleasing to the eye kind of environments. Like they do talk about the importance of architecture. That's like, that's like just nice to look at and nice to reside within and to also create like organic gardens. And uh, Rudolf Steiner had his own ideas on, on everything, but including uh, uh, architecture and agriculture. And so, yeah, you have the agriculture Ideally, you'd have all the stuff that Steiner talked about. Right. You'd be practicing in this whole environment. And so the intention is that by having people that are doing their inner work, that are creating harmonious relationships and, and structures that are supporting community and involvement and engagement, and that uh, the physical environment is pleasing and nourishing, that by doing all that stuff, you create like a kind of social therapy that helps these people that have their mental illnesses or their developmental disabilities to help them heal and grow. And since Steiner had his own esoteric, weird spiritual stuff, yeah, a lot of them, a lot of them had this belief that like these people with severe mental illness and developmental disabilities, intellectual disabilities, that you won't really fix them or help them come out of it. You know, this is permanent for their life. But in their next life, <laughs> after they die and are born into another body, another life, that would help them that time. So you're helping them get a good head start for their next life. Nah, you always get them with the next life. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the I O U, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um. Uh. So, are you still? Uh, do you think you're going to be trying to do any more commune projects, or what is your focus lately? Uh so I I kind of would say like thinking about the course of my life. Like I started out as like a pretty normal mainstream life with a regular job and stable living situation. Then I did all these things that we talked about here, including other ones too. I did a period of time as like a traveler kid, kind of yep. person on that, squatting and shit. Uh, and now I'm back in kind of where I was uh, metaphorically, not literally, uh, where like I have a normal job, normal lifestyle and apartments and all that kind of stuff, stable home. And like, so yeah, I'm not really involved in that intentional community part, but at the same time, I feel like the world as it is now <laughs> is crazy and unstable, uncertain. And I feel like just by like the economics and the ecology, political stuff, all this stuff could force me and you <laughs> and your listeners to like do radical different things in your life, whether you want to or not. <laughs> so, yeah. So I feel like my life is really normal, mainstream and boring, you could say, but I might be forced to by circumstance to adopt some kind of alternative living situation. Okay. But I don't have plans per se. 
uh, I'm keeping like, you know, my eyes and ears open to these things. But uh, I think part of it also, like my my partner is not really interested in living in an intentional community. Like she, you know, was a coworker of mine at that Camp Hill community and she did that for a few years, but doesn't want to do that kind of lifestyle thing anymore. And actually that is one of the biggest reasons too. A lot of people leave intentional communities, especially communes where you're really like immersed in each other's life. A lot of times people leave because of romantic partners, either either like one partner doesn't want to be there or a relationship breaks up, you know, and <laughs> you have the breakup stuff results in somebody leaving or, or uh, a relationship starting. So all these things like romantic partnerships, that is a big reason for membership to come or go. Mm -hmm. And that's also a lot of things that people often don't think about too. They think more philosophical reasons and not just like, romance <laughs> and what that can do to people. Yeah. Uh, and ideally, of course, you know, what the ideal situation would be is when these breakups happen or there's reason, you know, uh, there would be plenty of other options to still live in a different way from the nine to five, uh, renting everything sort of life that most of the working class has to live. Uh, but we're not there yet, right? Oh, no, no. Yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of, like, models. I mean, one thing, going back to Murray Bookchin, you know, like, even he, like, talks about, like, an approach of, like, having more community assemblies, like, neighborhood assemblies. And right. you know, everybody lives in, like, your block or your apartment building to, like, come together and you, you know, Bookchin ultimately wants meetings and stuff to, in a formal structure, but, but anything any systems of like mutual aid and mutual support, you can all could always be built in those kind of environments where you're at. Yeah. Which, uh, you know, I have person very, you know, this is something I'm doing on a daily basis is I'm in, uh, my partner is very much involved in the buy nothing group. If oh. you've heard of that. Um, no, no. Yeah. My partner's involved with a really, really free market, which sounds pretty similar. <laughs> uh, well, the buy nothing group is, uh, an everyday thing. And so right now it's mostly uh, run through Facebook, um, yeah. uh, a Facebook group uh, in whatever it's hyper local. And um, so it's sort of like if you have something you want other to get rid of or you don't need anymore or you have a service you could offer, you, ba you basically make a post to the group and then someone else in the group, you know, will claim it and then they have different mechanisms for you know if there's more than one person that wants the thing uh but another thing they do is uh they have like um tool sharing so they'll have a uh you know whether it's a weed whacker or you know lawnmower or, uh blow torch or whatever it is uh it's a tool rotation that you could get involved in and then they also have rotations for books and clothing and all those sorts of things so it's uh uh, and then once it gets beyond a certain size, they they split off into even more local uh, groups. Yeah, yeah, it um, seems to exist where I live too. And uh, and then the other thing is, uh, you know, for years now we've been doing a uh, neighborhood wide, just I guess uh, uh, it's kind of hard to describe. It's like a it's not formal and it's not necessarily anarchist, but it's definitely uh, dissenting and oriented towards fucking with the city and being an alternative to uh, sort of like the domination of the homeowners in the south, south part of town who uh, their voice tends to be represented more in the city council and everything like that. So it's like informal neighborhood also very focused on partying and things like that but yeah so yeah there's it's not the book chin model and it's also <laughs> especially not, not the partying <laughs> yeah and there's no income sharing there's nothing like that but um yeah it's a different thing that can be done as well and you know it's a lot of the same you know ideas about uh what can be done socially without like joining a union or anything like that um yeah yeah so uh what else i mean we're coming up on an hour here was there anything else you wanted to talk about uh let's see uh no well i guess one thing i would say though that's 
I do appreciate with the Camp Hill model, right, is uh, by focusing on people like with special needs of some form or another, I like it that it's a way to really proactively try to address like how can you like create healing, nurturing, supportive environments for people that need special care, right? And that's something that really speaks to me and even resulted in me like getting a job, you know, working in the caregiving field. I think that anarchists usually don't think about that. Like people that are like disabled or especially mentally disabled or people that have really severe like mental illnesses and things like that. Uh, like how can we support these people in an anarchist context? And yeah. especially with intellectual disabilities too, if and you create a direct democracy anarchist system, how do you include these people if they don't really cognitively understand a lot what's going on? And that's, I mean, that's a society wide problem. I mean, people who have to live at home and need, uh, in home care and things like that are basically invisibilized. I remember I had a uh, life insurance job launch, which was terrible, but I uh, wound up going to a lot of these places. And you just don't realize how big the population is of people that you don't see out on the street and you don't you know that are living these very different lives who just sort of are like a invisible class. Oh, and there's a lot of situations like that. Yeah, all the different nursing homes and group homes and prisons and jails and uh you know halfway houses all these different places like that that for us is like out of sight out of mind yeah and and they're very interconnected too a lot of the time oh yeah a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of times people go from like nursing home to group home or prison to halfway house or all that kind of stuff yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah just stuff between one prison uh, or one kind of institution to another in institution where they're basically constricted or confined to some degree yeah. And yeah, it's definitely worth thinking about. And I know it's uh, really hard to get uh, people who are street oriented as far as like street actions and protests and things like that to even think that it matters. Yeah. Yeah. But it does it's, for sure. Yeah. And like part of anarchism, I would say is like, not just like, like hating and like shitting on like the people at the very top, you know, <laughs> the presidents and CEOs and kings, what have you, but like uh, to acknowledge and recognize all the people that are in, made invisible as well. The people that are out of sight, out of mind to like have them be seen, have them be like lifted up as well. Yeah. And so, yeah. And so like, that's another part too, like, yeah, like kind of raising the bottom, so to speak, as well as like tearing down the top. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, it's a it's a hard point to sell, really. <laughs> but well, and, and a lot of what I'm talking about with utopian anarchism is a hard point to sell. <laughs> like you know, asking people to like uh, meditate, to like spend time with your relationships, like with nonviolent communication, and create these new radical structures, and like then rethinking architecture and agriculture and all those physical systems. Like it's it's all like a lot of work. But yeah, it's yeah, it's definitely harder to explain it to someone than to just show them which is sort of like the the big hurdle is getting from the point to where you have to sort of paint the picture for people mm -hmm. to the point to where you could just like invite them to a place and they could experience it yeah and but you know like even with that there there are ways you could show people just individually with each one of those four spheres right like with yeah. it the psychological, I invite people to go to dhamma.org, D-H-A-M-M-A.org. And that has for the uh, Vipassana meditation retreats, you know, that they have all around the world that are free of charge. And so that, to learn them and to show people, experience firsthand the meditation practice. And then likewise with uh, interpersonally, like there are nonviolent communication practice groups in retreats that happen all well, over as well. True. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You could do it piecemeal. Um, piecemeal, yeah, but not like whole one integrated big thing, which is ideally, you know, my utopia would include all the parts uh, holistically. Well, and then, uh, you know, something that's really good evidence for how effective that is, I think, is just the way that Occupy um, changed the lives of so many people that participated in it. You know, fuck whatever, you know, was written about it or reported on it. I mean, there's plenty of people whose direct experience will always way more than uh whatever the retrospective analysis has to say and well and well even with that yeah i guess for you know, people that have the experience of, yeah going to like an occupy encampment and being there yeah that would be the experience of being a, in a radically different environment but you know like even though like so i live in the minneapolis metro area minnesota and so even with 
here, like a lot more recently than Occupy, was the George Floyd uprising, and right. the, and like the whole area, like for example, where George Floyd was murdered, was like sh shut off from the rest of the city. Like they built barricades around it, and so that for like a year or so, like that was like a whole autonomous zone kind of thing, <laughs> and uh, including the whole thing like classes and free food and free clothing distribution and all kinds of stuff that were happening that the people in the local area in Minneapolis organized for there. And so for a lot of, and then even like, uh, of course there were like the riots and stuff that happened more immediately closely to when George Floyd was killed. And you know, that was a huge, both traumatizing as well as liberating, maybe even both for some people <laughs> uh, sure. experience. And so the, the whole experience of stuff surrounding all that for a lot of people, well, burning down the police station that happened in Minneapolis also, <laughs> like all these like kind of experiences like became like this, like peak experience, you could say, or experience yeah. that like when people lived it, it can change a lot of people's lives and stuff too. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And then, yeah, also just thinking about this, I mean, sort of the swing back into what you were just saying, you know, there is a big difference between uh, creating um, living spaces that are supportive of whether or not it's uh, people who need care or children that I think dramatically changes the whole approach. And you see a lot of anarchists sort of phase out of anarchist practice once they have kids and all of a sudden they're responsible for people more than themselves. And, uh, you know, I know Aragorn talked a lot about this and it, it seems like we still have to have these conversations uh, regularly because you know, what gets all the attention is what you do as a relatively unburdened uh, individual. And what doesn't get into the conversation is, well, what do you do when you really are dependent on other people? And that's when you see people getting, you know, whether they're sucked in through the welfare state or they're sucked in through uh, a career, um, you see them detach more and more from uh, involvement in anarchist spaces. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because like the time that the years that I was traveling all across the country and either visiting or joining different intentional communities, like that was a time in which I was more like in my 20s and didn't have a stable job, you know, didn't have any long term romantic partner, no children. So like that kind of context that made it possible for me to do all this like exciting stuff. But then like for, you know, getting older, you know, when people have more yeah. of a stable partner and they have kids that those kind of stuff draws people out. As well as like even like a stable full time job, you know, like that seems pretty innocuous. But when you think about it, 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 it takes so much like time and energy out of people in their lives. Well, and there's so many social like expectations that come with having a job that uh, it's not just about showing up. You also have to sort of groom yourself and prepare yourself to be the type of person your employer wants. Yeah. And a lot of the time that just doesn't fit with other options for lifestyle. Yeah, yeah. There's but like not, not just the hours that you're working, but there's the hours of preparation time and the hours of recovery time when you get off. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. It's a yeah. It's a, a full investment a lot of the time of uh, all of your practices. Yeah. Yeah. So so kind of like part of like the my approach of uh, both like the inner like inner work as well as interpersonal stuff is you acknowledge like the effect that having like a full time job would have, and then you know theoretically if somebody like this would be in an intentional community uh, because you do have models of intentional community where people have regular normal jobs. Right. They just give, they just turn over all their income to the community to have it be an income sharing environment. So theoretically you could create an intentional community where people like live in a big city and rent an apartment or something. And then you can work your full-time job, but you can like in your conversations with each other, like just be open and honest about how that's affecting you know, the person that's working there and how other people are affected by them. And, and just in a way being like clear and explicit about how we affect each other. That, that's a key part of like my approach to anarchism. So like, if you have like, well, like, yeah, there's all kinds of ideas you can go into like how you could run meetings and stuff too. That's a whole nother thing. Huh. A lot of times anarchists don't even really talk about it. Like there's a whole field of like organizational development people. Yeah, I'm, yes, and they're, handsomely paid uh, oh, by yeah, corporations yeah. to figure that shit out for them. 
Exactly. But like some of these people are talking about anarchist models that are more like decentralized horizontal structures and all of that. Of course, there's a, there's a book that came out not that long ago on uh, anarchism, organization and management. What? Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. my God. So you should uh, uh, I'll, give me a I'll, link for that. I'll link you to that. Yeah, I actually just sent it to a friend of mine I'm going to have on the show because they're in this space of uh, they're teaching a class right now about uh, dissent within organizations and Wow, yeah. I thought they might be interested, so I'll send that to you too. <laughs> oh, that's oh, that's great, yeah. Because a lot of times dissent in organization means somebody gets kicked out or fired. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it'd be nice to like to create systems for feedback. That's one thing that doesn't exist in our society or in anarchist circles even, uh, where like you can talk about like like openly and honestly talk about how someone's work is going you know not just work performance but like how interpersonally how they're getting along or not with each well, other you mean after i get my oil change the survey i fill out isn't enough feedback oh yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so like and that's kind of like more like the alienated kind of relationship yeah right? exactly yeah. yeah and so like ideally like an anarchist society in my opinion would have a lot more closeness and community and conversation and stuff where people really kind of more deeply know each other and understand each other and that goes for me, like a lot of uh, a frame for my ideal for utopian anarchist society would be based around Dunbar's number. <laughs> uh -huh. You're familiar with that? Yeah. Uh, I am, but go, go. I don't know who else is. So yeah, go yeah. ahead and explain that. So this guy, I forget his first name, last name Dunbar, of course, <laughs> and he created a number. <laughs> and so the number is that uh, the number of the maximum number of relationships people can have in their life where they still feel like they really know that person that they feel like there is a meaningful relationship and for him i think it's like somewhere around 150 more or less and so i think that's crucial for when you create like a with a society utopian community intentional community whatever that you have that number in mind and that like if you get higher than that number in my opinion you should split off you know bifurcate to create like a what do you call it like cell division <laughs> for, yeah for, like, yeah same thing you create a new community because if you go beyond that number, you begin to have alienated relationships where you don't really know the other person. And then I think when you have an alienated relationship, you can't really, you don't really trust each other. Like the trust is undermined since you don't really know that person. And I right. think trust is a key, key thing, uh, both like to have like, you know, intimate relationships, you know, each other where you really understand each other on a more sensitive level with dealing with emotions right but then trust is also necessary for like stuff like income sharing yeah because <laughs> well, you know, get really touchy about that it's like trust is the currency of social life in a lot of yes, ways yeah, it, exactly. like reputation and trust and all those things yeah and a lot of like restorative justice is about finding ways to restore and repair trust that has been damaged by somebody hurting another person and so like i think it makes it really, really difficult, if not impossible, to have trust when you have a social structure that's beyond Dunbar's number and you have the alienated relationship. Sure. And, you know, this comes up with nonviolent communication, too. People will say, like, you know, basically ask a question like, why would I do all this emotional labor to try to connect with the other person and I might not ever see him again? Like, I don't really know him and I might never come across him ever again. And so, like, and that's kind of a valid point. And so, in a way, like, I'd say, well, we should have these social structures that we can create now through intentional communities and can have more of like after a revolution, if a revolution yeah. ever happens. <laughs> and it's, a, it's also an interesting topic too, not to, not Dunbar's number, but the trust thing, because so much of like the uh, blockchain tech space is orientated towards building trustless um, forms of uh, exchange and stuff like that. And a lot of the economic and social principles that capitalism is based on are also, you know, concerned with situations where there is no trust. And yeah. uh, the prem the whole premise is uh, uh, starting, the jumping off point is uh, uh, how do you do economics without trust? In a lot yeah, of exactly. And, and so then I'm encouraged like to ask the other question, how do we do the, go the opposite direction and have there be more trust, <laughs> more communication, more intimacy and all this kind of stuff. And like navigating that, having the conversations and creating the relationships to do that. And, exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, I think we covered a hell of a lot of ground here. Um, and I definitely am happy I, to have you on the show. Oh, yeah, uh, thanks. Kind of, yeah, just to close it up a little bit. Um, 
anything else you wanted to plug or any projects or anything? Uh, let's see. Uh, I guess I'd encourage like, yeah, with regards to uh, what, like nonviolent communication. Yeah, you can just type that <laughs> on Google. Yeah, and, and, find and you'll send me links. I'll put all the links in the notes too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then uh, I'd say, yeah, intentional communities. Of course, there's ic.org for intentional communities. And then there's uh, the, T-H-E, uh, F-E-C, T-H-E, F-E-C dot org. So that is for the Federation of Egalitarian Communities. And uh, that's all these uh, secular, nonviolent, egalitarian, income-sharing communes <laughs> that exist in, uh, I think, all in the United States. And of course, yeah, dhamma.org for Vipassana meditation. And book Mr. Fuller, uh, I guess, uh, I'd say with his stuff, yeah, you can just similarly go to Google. You know, okay. It's like the <laughs> phrase Google Murray Bookton. You can also Google Bookmaster Fuller. <laughs> Perfect. Well, uh, thank you again, parentheses I, and I'm sure we'll figure something else out for you to come back and talk about. Oh, okay. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, see you all later. <laughs> yep.